Hello, everyone who is coming in to our Zoom webinar. Big welcome to you. Hello to everyone who's watching on our Facebook live stream. Good day to all of you. Excellent. We are here for this month's virtual tour of intentional communities where we sit down with three different intentional communities from throughout the US and around the world and learn about them and experience some of the diversity that we have in this great big movement that we call the intentional communities movement. And I see we have more folks coming in. Hello, hello. My name is Cynthia and I'm going to be the host for today's event. I'm calling in from Vermont, where I also live in an intentional community called Headwaters Eco Village. And I'm one of the co directors with FIC, the Foundation for Intentional Community. And I'm also a matchmaker for uh, people who are looking to join intentional communities. I connect them with communities that could be a good fit. So we're going to start with Dancing Waters Permaculture Co op. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we have Forrest here with us, all the way from Wisconsin. Welcome, Forrest. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Glad to be here. Um, so, yeah, my name is Forrest Yankee. I was actually born here in the barn at Dancing Waters Permaculture Cooperative, 32 years ago. Um, and Dancing Waters started in 1982 so we are we've been around for a minute uh here in southwest wisconsin the driftless area the lumpy part of the midwest that the glaciers missed repeatedly so we still have lovely road hills and valleys and uh I will be sharing my screen here with you so you can see a little bit. This is uh, some of the local topography. This is actually a map of our area. We're at the toe of this uh, long hill. Our buildings are clustered at the bottom of that. And we have uh, 130 acres of mostly pretty steep wooded hillsides, a couple acres of flat valley bottom where we have some hay fields in our gardens and the houses. Um, as a permaculture cooperative, we have a sort of permaculture zoning as far as uh, how much control and management we have over the property in some areas where we do very little or nothing and some areas where we control pretty fully in annual gardens and paths and buildings. And uh, for you familiar with permaculture zoning, um, and generally try to follow permaculture principles. Um, we own all the land and the buildings collectively. Um, we do not, we're not technically a commune because we each have our own personal incomes that we make and then we pay a monthly, uh, we don't call it rent, it's a running cost uh, of being here. And then there's a minimum expected equity for each member to uh, buy into, which it's tied to inflation at the moment, it's like $35,000. Um, and that can be paid over time, the minimum payment, like $100 a month. So um, pretty accessible in that way. There's no maximum equity. There are various members here who have uh, almost double their minimum equity just because they believe in investing in this place. And that's, sort of the basics of our membership uh, deal. We're a consensus-based process community. We have meetings often, uh, usually with an agenda and facilitator, note taker every couple weeks, um, twice a month or so. And then we have other gatherings. So I'm gonna just start flipping through some of these slides where I've grouped them by season. So it'll give you just a little bit of an idea of sort of the, uh, the seasonal flow here in, uh, in Wisconsin. So yeah, we've got lots of these little plants under lights 
these days, just about ready to transplant out into the greenhouse and the gardens. These are morel mushrooms. So some of the things that we wild craft and harvest from the wild around here. Uh, here we're doing some water quality monitoring in our little creek. Um, we're called Dancing Waters because we're the headwaters of the West Fork of Knapps Creek and we have many springs bubbling up from the ground and we can drink straight out of the spring and I have my whole life. Um, and here we're just monitoring it, making sure the E. coli and the phosphorus and all the things are good. We do burns. Uh, we've built a lot of the houses ourselves, um, although these days um, you have to contract out a lot more than we did before. So having a lot more of the, that sort of stuff done by experts, which is has its pluses and minuses. Uh, we also do maple syrup here, although we have in the last couple of years, uh, most of our other maple trees um, in the summer is really major, probably the most communal times because I think the gardens and food production is probably the most, really the center of community here. Uh, planting, harvesting, processing, eating, sharing food together. It's really all, all about that. So like I said, we've got some hay fields where we get hay for mulch for the gardens and for the animals, bedding and feed. Um, a lot of vegetables. Uh, people are involved to various extents in the community work at different angles. So, you know, some people are really into the garden. They put a ton of time and energy into that. Other people put more into uh, woods work or compost. Um, we have uh, point people. We've elaborated uh, all the different angles of work that happen in the community trying to make that invisible work visible and then we have a point person in each of those little committees and try to have uh, that be the way that uh, we deal with uh, the dynamic of if it's everybody's job it's nobody's job um, which is a common community and organizational dynamic um, so chickens gardens hills pigs. Here's some of the harvest. Uh, we have a very diverse apple orchard here uh, that my dad runs here. He sells some of his apples at the local farmer's market, which at the moment, that's really the only uh, outgoing food production we do. Pretty much all of our own food is for our own community consumption. Um, I've, I've put in my time trying to feed the world and uh, it's, a, it's a rough market out there. Uh, but we really value our tomatoes with their little flaws and uh, cracked cucumbers and whatever. Um, so, um, and then we do, as a permaculture community, we all try to integrate different parts of what we do into everything else as many ways as possible. So, you know, if pigs would not be worth it for us to raise if it was just for the pork, but it's for pork and they turn waste food scraps from the gardens and the kitchens and the local brewery and other places into uh, fertilizer and food and their entertainment and they grub up old fence lines for us and um, so it's it's all about trying to integrate as many things as possible in any way possible so that we can build off of that um, and so here we're making applesauce, and here we're making apple cider, and here are the fresh apples, and here's the pig, the apple fed. Um, so fall's, fall's a fun and busy time as well. In the winter, things slow down a lot. We go indoors, we do a lot of process work and more things, strategic things. Uh, these are little value bubbles that we created with sort of three different value areas and how they relate and cross over. For, um, firewood woods work is the main winter work bringing in the firewood um, we've calculated that we are about three quarters uh, energy self-sufficient by renewable energies um, which I don't know if you saw the solar panels on the barn about 15 percent of that is from the production we make there and 60% of that is because we heat the houses with our own firewood that we cut from our property. 
um, much of the energy people use around here is just keeping alive and warm in the winter. So um, that's, it's a big deal here. Uh, we also use the wood for here. We're inoculating some top logs. We grow mushrooms as well. Um, but yeah, firewood's the, the big winter work. And that way you can do the work while the ground is frozen. You don't rip things up so much. Um, yeah. And, you know, get together and dance and have fun and do things as well. Although that has, of course, been fairly interrupted over the past couple of years of weirdness. So, um, yeah, I'm thinking that's probably at least my 10 minutes. Uh, hopefully I'm coming through all right. Uh, ah, yes, membership process I'm supposed to touch on, which uh, our very minimal process right now is you have to have attended three community meetings and have met and spoken with every member of the current community and then you can ask for membership and start going through the membership process. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for us. We got it all. It was awesome. I love how you organized the presentation around the seasons too. And it's, it's so great that you grew up in the community. I mean, not many people have had that experience in that childhood and and obviously you like it so much you're still there how how was that for you like do you ever feel like oh I'm done with this like I want to like leave or or why why do you choose to stay in the community where you were born yeah so I didn't really stay per se um I've spent most of my life here. I went off to Florida for college for four years, and actually my parents and I lived in Mexico for two years. Community called Piña Palmera in Oaxaca, and um, we, I return there regularly. Um, I married with a Mexican and have a life down there as well, uh, and usually slip off there for a month or two of the winter, and we're starting to get involved in a little permaculture community down there. Um, and I may be living here for my entire life. Um, I'm, I, I'm a permanent member. So being born here, there is no birthright or anything. I member process and have my minimum equity that I'm buying into and everything. Um, but I decided to go through that process and become a permanent member and I feel uh, committed to this community in some way, shape, or form for life, for sure. Um, whether or not I'm living here full time, and there's been lots of shifting around of people over the years. We have three couples of kind of the OGs who were came in and either started or came in right in the first few years of the community. Of the, my parents, um, and then. There's 11 of us right now, so my wife and I, um, and then three more other folks. Uh, family hopefully coming into the space that over the last year we've just been putting up for short rentals and on Airbnb, which was good for us and we found a surprising demand for way out in the boonies because we're about we're very rural it's a 10 minute drive away from two towns of 400 500 people half of 5,000 people an hour and a half two hours to any real city by anyone's standard but you know there's people from Chicago coming out here you know driving six hours to see them way for the first time in their lives mm -hmm. or an owl hoot or a shooting star um mm -hmm. pretty crazy it's been an interesting mm -hmm. experience of bringing in new people briefly uh, we've had you know and in the long run we're not really looking to be land owners we'd like to be land partners and bring in committed members but the airbnb thing's been a good way to split income from an empty apartment so. yeah mm -hmm. yeah great thank you for sharing more of your your story and you did touch on a question that people had about how big the community is um we have another question um how how do you decide if someone can become a member? Is it, is it, you know, you decide that process, is it sort of just like, if no one has a problem with that person, they're in, or what does that look like? 
Yeah, so we have a multi-tiered process. Like I said, there was those basic requirements and you can request membership and then you become a trial member. And for that period of time, at that point, you start paying your fee. You are fully a part of the decision-making process as much as anyone else, um, living on the land, being a part of all the work. Um, and then point, um, and during that process, it, you can be through a community meeting and process, you could be asked to leave even one member was adamant about that. Um, and then uh, becoming a permanent member at some point. Um, and at that point that can be requested by the trial member. Uh, you don't have to have your full equity purchased or anything, but usually you two, three years when um, a little more decisive. And um, if you become a permanent member, then uh, basically, you would have to be, you would have to either leave yourself or it'd be a consensus decision to have that person leave. Um, and equity can equity would be given back to someone leaving. Our first the first five thousand dollars of the equity payment is considered a membership fee, and that's not refundable. But after that, all the equity you build up, if you leave and decide you want that. Um, you can ask for that to be returned to you. Um, mm -hmm. Although I will say that uh, most people who never asked for their money back, they decided they lived here for plenty cheap for plenty amount of time and it was a good investment for them. And, uh, but we have had members who have left and have asked for it back. So that's, it's happened both ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And there was a question during the trial membership period, are people living there at least part-time or full-time? Yeah. Full-time, I do, yeah. yeah. There, we don't really have an absentee members kind of thing. Um, I mean, there are people, like I said, who have left and still hold equity, but they are no longer part of the decision-making process. It's for the of us who are living here. Mm -hmm. And you can take sabbaticals and we have members who, you know, have done meetings for a decade and uh, need a sabbatical from that and are just like, okay, y'all take care of the decision making process, I'm going to do that. Or So we, we do have some flex in all that and we've, we're still developing and playing with our, our process and that's it's a part of the the learning. Um, we've integrated the seven-step process. Um, Tim Hartnett's in the census-oriented decision-making, seven-step decision-making process has been very helpful for us in uh, moving forward progressively in our decisions and not just talking in circles. So um, that's been really good. We've used various tools to help understand ourselves and our process better. It keeps developing. Amazingly, we made it through like 30 years without a real explicit blocking process, but I think we have a pretty decent one now um, and well elaborated. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah, it's, it is inspiring to see a community that seems quite stable and, and has been around for so long. So that's great. And do you have one last question for you, um, which this person has asked me to ask of all of our panelists. So get ready. Um, are your all are your members required to be vaccinated? Um, and then maybe I would expand on that. How about visitors too? We don't have any requirements. It's every household has their own sensitivities and their own uh, level of precaution. And uh, I'll just respect whatever that is, basically the, the safest denominator and the space that we're sharing space in. And, but yeah, we don't have specific requirements for that. Okay, okay. Good, and I, I see there is another question for you in the chat, so I'll let you answer that there. But um, thank you so much, Forrest. Really appreciated getting to know you and your community.
Yeah, and next we're gonna travel over to Portland. So we were just in a quite rural community. Now we're gonna go to a more urban community and learn about a community in the Larch Community Network. So we have Savannah here and I'm really glad that you're with us and excited to learn from you. Oh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Sav or Savannah and I live uh, at Larch Portland in Portland, Oregon. And Larch Portland is an intentional community made up of people with and without disabilities. And our goal is to share life together, to build a home and share a home and build meaningful relationships together. And I actually ended up coming to this community because I was graduating from college and I was like, you know, one day when I retire, maybe I really wanna live in a community like with people with disabilities. There's a famous author, Henry Nowen, who was a part of a large community. And I didn't really know the language, but I was like, I wanna be, I wanna do what Henry Nowen did. And like, as I'm retiring, like go somewhere and live with people. And then my friend was like, that's a real thing. They're all over the world. And I was like, oh, cool. And I've really wanted to move to Portland. And so got the opportunity to do that. So we are an, an intentional community. We're made of three homes, started in 1987. And again, we're all about sharing life with each other, people with and without disabilities. And Larch has always been a response to the institutionalization of people with disabilities. And so we're trying to deinstitutionalize that. Our homes aren't like facilities, they're homes. And I have a little clip to kind of just share um, from an old assistant that used to work with us. And she has a little bit to share and then our old executive director as well. But this is a video of somebody who is an anthropology student that moved to a live-in position, which I'll kind of explain more. And she kind of talks about how folks with disabilities are not really something that everyone, are not people that everyone comes in contact with or people feel comfortable coming in contact with because of a lot of stigma. So gonna hear a little bit more. From a young age, we're not taught in a lot of ways that these are normal people, that it's okay, that you can walk up and say hi to them. We can hear it, but we can't hear it. It's safe and even a worthwhile thing to engage with them. In school, you know, when I studied anthropology, we never talked about disability rights. You know, we talked about race, we talked about class, we talked about gender, and we're really good at talking about those things. but we're still in a lot of ways pushing people with disabilities aside and not giving them a space where they can be seen and heard and admired and accepted as the gift that they are. We are acknowledging the gifts of all people and offering a space for all people to be celebrated. We really build community around people with intellectual disabilities because we see the gifts, the authenticity, the vulnerability that they both share and call us to. It's not a place we come to fix each other, but it's a place where we can be with one another. Ben is we'll Ben. Watch this portion of the video in a little bit. Um, so hopefully you learned a little bit more about why Larsh is an important community for people with and without disabilities. We need one another and we have gifts to share with each other. And so um, Larsh International, it's all over the world. Larsh International has these pillars of spirituality, growth, loss and grief, simplicity, forgiveness, authentic relationships, prayer, celebration, welcome, suffering and joy, light for the world. These are all things that inform the practices of, of Larsh. And Larsh International was founded on Catholicism and more evangelical Christian beliefs. And a lot of communities around the world still base their practices on that. But Larch Portland is a little bit different in that we're more of an interfaith community. There's a lot of different faiths and beliefs that are practiced, um, Buddhism and Islam and Quakerism and evangelicalism and agnosticism. There's people of all different beliefs and traditions. And something that I really love, I came from an evangelical background and kind of had my own religious spiritual transformation and have found so many new practices that I love from Buddhism and Quakerism and 
um, a lot of us kind of incorporate a lot of different practices into our into our life. And so there's some pictures here of some folks at a celebration and uh, with some cupcakes. And then we have a foot washing practice that we love to do and some blessings. So here's one of our folks with disabilities, a core member, Robin, she's blessing Andy. And then we have some sweet friends down here. We love friendships. Uh, the most important part of Large to me is the authentic relationships that I've built with people with and without disabilities and how we see that those relationships last long after people have moved out of our homes. So we have two kinds of homes. We have our east side homes. They're on the east side of Portland. Um, they're called the Nehalem House and the Nia Connie House. You see a picture here that is from when the house first opened in 1987. And then you can see in that next picture, the same porch is there. There's folks still living there, including some of our original core members that moved in in 1987. And so I keep saying core members without explaining it, but we have four core members at both of these homes. Core members are the folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities and they live in the home. And then we have space for four live-in assistants. Assistants are direct support providers that are paid 40 hours a week to work there, but choose to live in because they wanna be a part of community all the time and I am a live-in right now and started as an assistant and now even in my new role I'm a community and recruitment coordinator I still live in because I enjoy it so much and then there's a picture on the most right that's the house I live at Nia Connie we're we're quite the bunch over here um <laughs> and it's it's a fun place to live it's very challenging at times um it's hard to live where you work but it's also really rewarding and a lot of relationships, people that used to live here that are still connected decades later. We have another home. This is our third home. It's called Gabriel House. It opened in 2019, so pretty fresh. And it's in Beaverton, which is just on the west side of Portland, so not too far. And this is a home that no one is paid to live there and there's people pay rent to live there and or we call it like a program fee. And it's folks with and without disabilities that choose to just live together because they want to. They want to live in intentional community. And we don't provide any paid services, but there are some folks with disabilities who do want some a couple hours a week with someone to help them with activities of daily, daily life. And so they, um, they receive services from an outside provider and we're supportive with that. And it's a, also a really fun house to live in. There's, I think you can see the White House in the background. It's like this beautiful house. And all of our houses have like eight to 10 rooms. So lots of space. All right, I have one more clip. Let's see if the audio works this time. Butternut squash lollipops. How's that sound? Do you want candy made out of vegetables? No. <laughs> uh, no way. No way. That sounds gross. Hey, it'd be you cook me. You happy when I cook with you? Yeah. Happy when you cook with me. Butternut oh, squash lollipops. Way. How's that sound? <laughs> Gonna learn a little bit more about one of our core members, Ben. Ben has been a member of Larsh for over 20 years. One of Ben's gifts is welcome. And he does it in an unconditional, loving way that is immediate. And we're all on a journey together, but we need others to journey with us, that we can't do this alone. So I think that is a gift of all people who are marginalized is they can't hide the need that they have for others. Nice. Good. He just brings people in and he celebrates relationships so much more than he celebrates task or success, which I think is kind of the heart cry of so many of us is that we just want quality time with people we care about. And, and that's Ben and he does that really well. Whoa. Wow.
if you head to our YouTube at Large Portland, there's a lot of other videos that have more of the voices of the folks with disabilities in our community. There's a really fun chicken proposal video when we propose to have chickens at one of our house, uh, houses that made me laugh. But there are several ways that you can be involved at Large Portland. You can be a live-in assistant. That's that paid role to live in. We have live out assistance, folks that are paid to, or folks that are paid to support our homes, but don't live with us. They're part of our community. The Gabriel House, you can be a member there. We're hiring a business manager if you're interested in a more administrative position. We have summer community interns and we always welcome interns. Volunteers, we have a board of made up of people with and without disabilities that we're welcoming people to join. And then there's always friends of our community, people that just love what we do and love the people. And some of those folks have disabilities and live in other places. And some of those are just folks that wanna be around us. So that's fun. I'm gonna share some information on the screen. Hopefully everyone can see it. Our website's at the top. It's larch, L-A-R-C-H-E dash portland.org. And there's a couple different emails. If you want to live with us, you can email live at Larch Portland. If you want to apply and work with us in one of those um, live in assistance or live out assistance or the business manager role, apply at Larch Portland. And then if you just want to get more info, info at Larch Portland. So thank you everyone for listening and dealing with the, the technology things. <laughs> Thank you so much, Savannah. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, it was nice to have the video clips. So I'm glad we made that work because it did just give us a, a window inside one of your communities. I've never been to a large community, but I have been to a few Camp Hill communities. Yeah. They're, they're similar. Yeah. Almost similar. So. Yeah. Same mission, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a very powerful experience for me um, and really really walking the talk of inclusivity for the most marginalized members of our society. So yeah, and I mentioned in the video, Andy said like folks with disabilities often can't hide their need for other people. And that's something that I've learned is that I have a need for people too. It's there's no special needs. I also need to brush my teeth and be with my friends and watch movies. And so I've learned to not only support other people, but have them support me too. Mm. Mm, yes, I love that. Um, well, folks, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, I do have a question for you. So I was curious, how has the COVID experience been in your community and in the network of large communities? Yeah, it's been difficult because as, as folks might know, folks with disabilities are often more at risk for in general sickness like the flu, but especially COVID um, just because of autoimmune things. And um, so we were pretty shut down for a while. And we also are, because we're county licensed, we have some like additional rules that we have to follow. And so it was really tough for uh, the same way that it was tough for everybody to be, you know, in their homes it was even more tough because our community is so wide that like folks who have been interacting with our community for years couldn't come into the homes for a really long time. And um, folks with disabilities are, they're no stranger to loneliness and isolation, but we're always trying to expand that um, and build community. And so it was really hard for our organization when we had to kind of close things down a bit, but we're happy that we're, you know, we're have the vaccine and have a lot of um, opportunities to still interact with each other, like among the houses and have been welcoming folks into our homes in safe ways. And it's been, when I came, we were shut down. So I didn't have the Larsh experience for a while. Um, so it's really beautiful to see all of our community members still come back to us and want to be a part of people's lives. Mm, mm, wonderful. Do you feel it's a place where you could see yourself long-term, like really like not only working there, but really just having a full life in the long-term? Yeah, I think so. I think um, we're always, our like application and our application process is called discernment. So we're very big on like, it's a mutual discernment of, do we think that you can thrive here and do you think you can thrive here and let's find the tools to do that and so we're always kind of in discernment but I 
even through the challenges, I've really found myself coming back to this community and the relationships. Erin, um, one of our core members is like one of my best friends and like I can't imagine my life without her. And I think that that's how a lot of folks feel is I can't imagine not having my housemates in my life and really do believe in the mission and values. And so even if I were to move out one day, I think that I would still be a really active part of the community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm, wonderful. <laughs> I like that expression of discernment. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of good. funny because it's like, I don't know how to explain it without using the word, <laughs> but it's, I think it's helpful to not be like, we're rejecting you. It's like, we're discerning together, like whether this is going to be good for all of us. So yeah, totally. Great. Ah, okay. Thank you so much for sharing. Really appreciate it. Good. Um, now we're going to go to our third presenter, presenters now um, of the day. We have Michael and Sarah with us from Chrysalis Community, and they're in Virginia. So welcome to you both. Looking forward to what you have to share. Thank you. Yeah, um, this is Sarah. I just want to say uh, thank you so much for inviting us on. Uh, it's really wonderful to see what FSC is doing these days. And if, if you could speak up a little bit, there's a little little trouble hearing your audio. Can you hear uh, at this level? Does it work? Yeah, we can hear you. It's just a little muffled. And some people wrote they were having trouble hearing. Okay, we're just trying to block the background noise. Uh, All right, is this any better? Maybe. Um, better. It's better when you, yeah, speak loudly. This? Is this better now? Mm, potentially, um, maybe. <laughs> okay, back to this one. How's this one? Sorry. Uh, uh, I don't know if I can hear a difference. Okay, all right, we'll just try that. Okay, need to. Okay, technology. Yeah, you ready to speak there? Sure. Technology dominates once again. <laughs> it's okay, we'll turn up our volumes. <laughs> okay, Chrysalis Community is just outside of Washington, D.C. It's uh, literally six minutes from uh, <clears throat> ground zero. And uh, the reason we were there is because there are a lot of people who are trying to make change in the world, who are trying to do good things. But when you're living by yourself and you come home, or if you're living with other people who don't get what you do, why you do what you do, it can be very discouraging. So Chrysalis is, um, unlike a lot of other communities, Chrysalis is focused on supporting the people who are there to do things other than the community. Uh, we have uh, two houses side by side uh, in Arlington, Virginia, which is a close suburb of DC. And there's a, uh, it's a beautiful setting. Uh, we're right next to a 350 acre park. And we, there's room for five people in each house. Now, the two houses are literally side by side, just a few feet apart. And they function kind of like one big house with crafty hallways. And that's what we want to do is create a situation where people have friendships and connections with other activists, other people doing things that will hopefully make the world a better place. And you think of activism in a very broad sense. 
Um, it can be, for example, one person is a professor of environmental chemistry. Um, other people do all kinds of things uh, that are designed to make the world a little bit better place. Uh, we don't, as a group, do any single activism. So there are three of us who've been there a long time, 10 years or more, uh, who do share a specific kind of activism, and that is culture change. And what we're doing there is trying to help people develop themselves so that they're more they're more present and able to see how to make a difference in the world at large. One of the lines that uh, comes up is that it's very difficult to bring peace to the world when you're at war with yourself. So that aspect of changing people to help them change the world is kind of core for the three of us. And Chrysalis is also tied to other communities. Um, we actually have kind of a sister community out in rural West, West Virginia. And again, there, there's a lot of outreach. The focus is actually on connecting with the people who are already living there, making their lives better, and doing what we term a rural revitalization project. That one's called Allegheny Crest Intentional Village. We, we run three local businesses there. The place had been, uh, the town had been collapsing until we came along and revitalized it. So oh, another community that we're connected with is a non-residential community called Network for a New Culture. And the, again, the vision of Network for a New Culture is how do we create a world uh, where we work out our problems without violence. And so mostly we're creating events uh, that bring people together to experiment and learn skills related to that question. And uh, back before COVID, we, we used to host a bunch of events at Chrysalis Community, evenings, weekends, and so on. So there was always a lot of flow in and out of, of the larger of our two houses in Arlington. Um, however, COVID has brought a stop to most of that. Uh, we hope to be able to do it again soon, um, but currently on hold because uh, we're mostly very cautious about COVID. The people who do live here each have their own area of interest and it's a core value for us to preserve each person's autonomy and freedom of choice uh, in whatever they do. And some of the things that we do as part of our outreach is we teach consent and we teach communication skills. And this all comes back to us uh, in our community living, that when there's a challenge or conflict between people, that we can have those tools to make it work well. The, the texting, are you going to show slides? Yeah. Because if not, they're just looking at this oh. possibly instead of our faces. Good point. This is one of the houses, the larger of the two. And the, the railing, uh, the balcony up there is a wonderful place to watch lightning storms. This is the other house right next to it. And the front yard that, that's in this picture is not the current front yard. Uh, that, that yard gets used for many different things. Often it's an organic garden. This is part of the living room in the larger house. This is the way it looks on a day to day basis. And you'll notice the, the guitar, uh, a number, and the drum, and the keyboard. A number of us are, uh, are musicians, amateurs, but we, we still go for it. This is the dining room. And what's lovely about this particular uh, space is that we're surrounded by nature. You can see uh, the windows on all sides and all you see is trees. This is the living room of the house, uh, of the smaller of the two houses. Um, again, it's gathering for the people who live in that house and gets used to various things, including you. We have, we love enjoying the outdoor spaces in a variety of ways. The trampoline is the favorite. This is a picture of the entrance to the park. It's literally just a few feet from our, our property. And it's across the street. So our street is a cul-de-sac and there's no houses on one side, which abuts to this. It's a rails to trails park. So you can get on it and walk for uh, 
Yeah, from miles and miles. All the way out to Ohio, even it That's connects true. to the CNO Canal. Uh, so. <laughs> and then um, the park uh, has both untouched uh, nature preserve dimensions to it, as well as things like um, you know basketball courts and soccer fields and things like that. So it gives you both sets of energies, which is really lovely. Because again, outreach is a very important thing for all of us. Biking is actually an important part of the game as well. We are right at the intersection of three of the largest bike of the main three of the main bike paths in the region. Uh, so from there you can kind of go anywhere. This is an um, an example of a meeting that we had when we expand the living room and use the whole thing. Um, the living room can actually hold up to 50 people. And we've had events that, of all kinds that, again, not lately because of COVID, but before and hopefully sometime soon afterwards, we'll be able to have these kinds of meetings again of various sorts. This particular one uh, had to do with uh, political organizing, but our members are, are welcome to use the resources we have for whatever their particular passion and, and mission is. We've also had house concerts there from time to time. Uh, again, being musicians, we love to invite other musicians where we can. This is an example of a house dinner. Um, we have not as often as you might as we might like because each person has their own activity mission, commitments, and so coordinating to get everybody together for a meal is, uh, herding cats is definitely easier, much easier. We've also uh, have space for various kinds of workshoppy kinds of things. Um, when uh, the new culture events that we put on needed a 40 foot dome, and we wound up building it from scratch. And at Chrysalis, we have uh, nice workshop areas. Some of the work is being done here. And then here's Sarah at an earlier time, crunching pipe. This is the uh, setting for the our sister community out in rural West Virginia, which is great because our people can go back and forth as they choose. So they have an urban setting when they want to get engaged with other people who are in a high intensity environment. And when they want to get back to nature, that's an available thing as well. That's part of our forest out there. And that's the whitewater stream that runs through the whole property. So we're now trying to figure out how to get back to the there we go. So that's um, that's basically us at, at Chrysalis. Um, that again, the, the big difference is that from many other communities is that we focus on outreach. And that, um, we're always looking for how can we use what we're learning and what we gain from our community and share that with the world in some way, shape, or form. And the financial model and how we. Oh, but the. The people who are activists are often on the move. So uh, there's no intention here that someone should live here forever. They can. Uh, Sarah and I started this about 20 years ago and actually grew out of a previous uh, intentional community uh, that went back into the 60s. But uh, so we have three of us that have been there for more than a decade and likely to continue. Uh, but other folks come and go, and that's part of the, uh, the, the great part of it. Um, usually people here are anywhere from three months to three or four years. But we had one person that we admitted as a resident for three weeks. He was the world's leading authority on aquatic ecosystems and one of the most fascinating human beings to talk with I've ever met. Well worth learning. Uh, we also ha have uh, had an investigative journalist who stayed with us a number of times 
and has written uh, some very well received books. Um, again, a fascinating person to, to know and learn from. So the financial model is, is basically a rental situation. That gives and, people the greatest flexibility to come and go as they need. Right, and the different spaces have, have different um, pricing and it also depends on how long you're planning to stay. We're flexible about that and, and it can be renegotiated for the rest of the time. Yeah, we designed it so that people can come for as long as they need to and if it changes, all of that's already worked out ahead of time. So there's, there's no stress that somebody needs to go sooner or, or stay longer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've kind of covered what we're about. Uh, I guess happy so, to hear questions. I'll say one more thing, which is that we like to, we try to establish in, in at Chrysalis uh, a culture of transparency and clear communication, saying what you want, saying yes to what you want, saying no to what you don't want, you know, not letting uh, difficulties fester under the surface, bringing them out, um, and so on. That's part of the skills that we're teaching in the new cultural work as well. And finally, uh, nobody who lives at Crystal's has to participate or be involved in any of the other communities that are completely at choice. Yeah, nor, nor is anyone expected to work on anybody else's project. People, the whole point is to be able to support people who are doing good things in the world, to let them do their thing their way. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Sounds like a great mission to support people who are doing yeah, important, meaningful things and to have a community not be yet another thing they need to pay attention to, but really something that can be nourishing their work. Uh, how, how many people are there right now, out of curiosity? There's nine right now. We have room for 10 altogether. Uh -huh, okay, so you have one space available. How, how might someone go about um, going to live there? What is, what is your kind of membership process look like? A resident it's, pretty straight, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, mm -hmm. People contact us in, for whatever method they happen to. Uh, we explain what we're about. We find out what they're about. We try and understand how what we're about matches who they are in terms of their activism, which can take many forms. And it's not, our concept of activism is not narrow at all, it's extremely broad. But as long as the person has a strong outward focus and a strong focus on service in some way, shape, or form, that's entirely compatible with what we're about. And so, then once you know, once once we go through some preliminary information, if it looks like the person might be a good fit, uh, we can have them kind you know get in touch with the other folks there, and you know if there's a match, then we're all set. This often can happen very quickly, uh, in a matter of a few days or a week or so. Yeah. Did you want to add something to that, Sarah? No, it's a, just to summarize an initial screening interview and then uh, a visit either in person or in Zoom is usually what happens. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, what kinds of projects are residents working on? Like what, if you could give an example, I know you had mentioned the visitor um, you had who was engaged in ecosystems, but what, what other things are folks up to? Okay, we've got one person who's involved with educational reform and sex and gender justice, who also volunteers with National Park Service. Uh, we've got a climate change activist working with a local NGO, and somebody working on urgent health care matters who will eventually enter med school, and a returned uh, Peace Corps volunteer who's focusing on international issues. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of deep work. <laughs> yeah. As well as the the three already mentioned to uh, create the new culture events and, and uh, culture. You know, yeah. the West Virginia project. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, I, yeah, there's a, yeah, there is a question here about growing food. Do you do much food growing? Yeah, that has, uh, that comes and goes. It depends on when we have somebody who's excited about gardening. And so for about 10 years, we had organic gardens in both, both front yards. And that person uh, had been here almost a decade. And they, they had uh, actually moved in with a partner someplace else. And since that time, uh, we haven't had anybody as dedicated as they are. Uh, but again, the next person who shows up may be a fanatic gardener and we'll have uh, overflowing uh, organic uh, gardens again. Right. 
Good. Okay. I love that. Um, yeah. Flexibility based on uh, who's there and what their passion is. That's what the community goes for. Yeah, that, that's, that's very much a difference. Is that there isn't, it isn't like the community does this and this is what you have to do to fit in. It's mm -hmm. more a matter of the community supports you in doing whatever it is that you, you know, whatever your passion is. Yeah. 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 Interesting model. You, you asked earlier about vaccination and mm -hmm. so, uh, as I said, we're, we're pretty cautious about COVID, and so we do ask people to be vaccinated for the vaccine um, to join the community. I hope that sometime soon that, that you know, we'll be past all this and not have to go through all that, but uh, that's our current situation. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michael and Sarah. Thank you. Thank you to learn about what you're up to. Well, we're coming into the um, closing portion of our time together. So for our audience, if you are sitting on questions, especially questions that might be relevant for um, you know, all of our panelists, or if you want to follow up about something that one of them shared, uh, I would love if you could put your questions in the Q&A box. And even better would be if you want to uh, find the raise your hand button and ask your question out loud. I really do like hearing some different voices in our space. So yeah, if you have questions, would love to hear them. And if there isn't something immediate, I do have a question that I'm hoping um, you all could touch on in your own way and we can just kind of popcorn style. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about this particular moment that we're in as a world with so many, um, yeah, big, big challenges. We've, we've touched on a few and we have an activist, well, you're all activist communities in one way or the other, whether it's permaculture or focusing on people with special needs. Um, you know, we have the Ukraine situation still coming out of the pandemic, economic and uncertainty, inflation, more and more polarization. So just like, how do intentional communities fit in this as a solution, as, um, you know, obviously these communities, all the ones we have here today are, are quite small individually, just a few people. So how, how do you sit with this? How do you um, find meaning in the way you're going about your lives, living in community. So, anything you want to share around that? I think um, for me and for Large Portland, we do have a lot of, I think something that we do well is listening to each other. And while a lot of us align on a lot of things, especially as people who care about folks with disabilities, like when it comes to disability justice, we kind of all agree on a lot of basic things, but outside of that, there's a lot of differing opinions. And I think something that we really try to practice is listening to each other and then listening to people outside of our community. And we, one of our core values is mutuality. And in the sense that no one is, no one's opinion is above another person's opinion. Obviously we have like, because we're a nonprofit, there's some hierarchy and like leadership like somebody makes has to make a decision at the end of the day but we really do try to listen to each other and also care about things that are going on in our world um and for Larsh we're connected all over the world so there's a Larsh community in Ukraine so connecting with them and figuring out ways that we can offer support and also figuring out how we can support folks with disabilities to support other folks with disabilities or other people, how we can equip them and give, give them the information that they need and help them find information so that they can advocate for themselves and for other people. So it's, it's a hard dance because there's a lot going on and it can be hard to focus on things outside of community sometimes, but it's important. And I think that we're always trying to, to do that well. I'd like to speak to that too. Um, oh, and it, it, I just remembered, uh, can you all hear me okay? Yep, okay, we can cool. hear you. Um, 
I just remembered, Sav, one of our members a few years back actually worked at a large community local path in, in the uh, Virginia suburbs of DC. So that was pretty cool. Um, so communities are little laboratories of, of social change. You know, we're all figuring out how to get along with each other, how to work with each other. Um, one of the hallmarks of modern uh, Western society is alienation and separation. And in a community, uh, when it's going well, you know, we, we can replenish each other's uh, deeper needs for connection. So I think that that is absolutely crucial in this time, especially with all the isolation of COVID and so on, um, is to have that ability. And, uh, you know, each community has its own mission or its flavor. Ours was the mission of gathering people who are trying to make change uh, and help supporting, having them support each other by making connections and so on. Uh, when we were doing events, we'd have lots of people come by and people would, one person would say, oh, I'm working on this. And someone else would be, oh, I know five other people who are doing that. Or you need to know this person. Or, or I tried that, you know, or here's a resource. And so I, I think having these places that are just fertile ground for connection, collaboration, networking, mutual support is just absolutely crucial. I think that's the key role of urban community. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in here as well. Um, there's certainly challenges facing the world um, here on our property in this area. We deal with floods more than anything uh, every single year. Now, your floods now come just about every year or two um, or multiple times a year. So that's a huge focus for us going forward is just trying to keep this and watershed as stable as possible and keep having as light a footprint as possible. Um, and it does seem like there's a huge call, need, desire for community and belonging. Um, seems like there's more and more people looking for that. And uh, a lot of people don't really know where to start. So I really appreciate all the work that uh, FIC does. I think it's really important um, because there, yeah, there's a lot of desire for this and uh, zero knowledge about decision-making processes and some of the really important basics of, uh, of community. Um, and there's a, a lot of people on the community, although Dancing Waters itself is more of a residential living community, are fairly involved in the wider community. Several of us work for a nonprofit organization called Corn Stewardship Project, uh, doing food systems work and water quality monitoring and well testing and um, lots, of, uh, lots of ways to engage the community outside of the community bounds. And I think it's important to keep those relationships alive and keep, uh, keep all our neighbors close, even uh, you know, no matter they have in any given election. Um, some of us really try to be involved in the local government at the township level, the county level, um, where things are still a little bit less partisan. Explicitly, they are nonpartisan. Um, so I think, yeah, it's uh, there's really good work being done on all levels. It's definitely a hard moment, all the isolation and the divisions, but um, I think community is the answer to so much and there's a lot of people looking for it. So um, let's keep experimenting and finding good ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think there's this um, misperception that intentional communities are these bubbles like off in the country and they're disconnected from, you know, out of society, but yet we're very much in society and, and grappling with things and trying to form relationships where we can and do the good work. So yeah, really appreciating all your shares. Michael, did you want to add anything to that? Anything on your mind? Oh, you got to unmute. Sarah pretty much summed up the, the approach we have to it. Um, again, it's, it's a matter of you know, one of the many 
subtasks we have is that by helping activists heal, they'll be more effective in what they do. Mm. So that's a piece of the puzzle as well, getting people healthy enough and enough at peace with themselves so they can actually see what's, you know, what to do. I, I spent many years, I've, I've been involved in activism since I was a teenager, which is a very long time ago. And, you know, I've watched over and over and over again, people who think they are being activists, they're coming from a place of anger or upset. And they do things that are often counterproductive or at the very least ineffective. To be effective at, at any kind of social change, you really need to start internally first, get to a place of peace where you can see what's real, you can accept what's real, and you can clearly think about strategies for making it different rather than being reactive. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, doing that inner work, making sure that you're doing the work from a, a place where you're, you're nourished and, and have more healing support. Great. Good. Well, thank you all so much for answering that question and also for sharing about your communities and taking the time to be here today and just taking the time to live the lives you're leave, living and um, helping to grow and do the work within your your communities and that are each each coming at it from a different angle, but like working towards the same vision. So I really love that. And I'm going to put, oh, yep, yeah, Michael. There's one question that didn't get addressed yet. Someone asked, how do you split up responsibilities? Okay. Which, you know, yeah. I don't, it's, you're running the show, but I just noticed that that one had not gotten addressed. Okay. Yeah. And I just see Angela put a question in the, um, in the chat box a well about growing food, which we, I think we addressed in core principles. I feel like we, we covered that. Um, but yeah, it's sharing responsibilities. Um, yeah. Do we want to touch on that briefly? Anything you may have missed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mentioned it very briefly in our presentation, how we we tried to divide up as many of the activities that happen on the land, you know, all the way down to wood splitter maintenance, tractor maintenance, compost pile, you know, into committees basically. And there's wider committees times. And each one of those committees has a point person. And that point person is not necessarily responsible for doing all the work. Sometimes there's two point people, but they are responsible for making sure that all happens at least, and then everyone's under the different committees and we uh, figure things out that way. And for some of the jobs like septic system maintenance and chimney cleaning, things that happen on a regular basis but can get punted down the road indefinitely, we've uh, established a spring and a fall work day where it's like, all right, we're all gonna get together and we're the septic systems. And we're all going to make sure the chimneys are scrubbed and we divide into groups and make sure that all gets done. Um, so those have been a couple of the ways we've we've used to to deal with that and try to be out tasks. Um, but it's it's pretty free flowing. And as people are able, willing, passionate about um, and things change too, you know, and then the last few years we haven't had chickens because some folk, you know, the folks who are in charge of that had other things going on, didn't have the time. We're now buying eggs from our neighbors, have excellent rain, you know, pasture fed eggs, and we're buying eggs for the same price it cost us to raise chickens. So, um, you know, we, we have shifted over the years. We've let go of something and on things. Um, but those are just a couple little things we've implemented. Mm. Mm. That's great. Yeah, for uh, in our homes, I mean, I think any healthy home has some splitting of responsibilities and it's usually doesn't come without any tension sometimes of having to remind each other like, hey, I always take out the trash. Can I, my hope is to not take out the trash this week. Um, we communicate a lot with like blocks. So being like, I have a block to washing the dishes. I do not have the capacity to do that today or I really hope to wash the dishes I 
kind of want to daze out and just wash dishes today. Um, we try to balance things out in that way and also incorporate the people that live in our homes. So core members seeing what they're what they're interested in. Um, a lot of folks, some of our core members like really love to help with things. So some of them have things that they do every day, like gather the eggs, we have some chickens or take the trash cans out every week or help with dusting. And we try to lean on each other and also just not take on everything ourselves because that usually leads to some resentment, but always growing <laughs> and doing our best to work with each other. Mm -hmm. I like that. I have a block. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I would say that we do things fairly similarly to the way Savannah does. Um, that there's there's also recognition that different people have different tolerance levels. So a room that I might think of as not pretty clean, somebody else might think of as unbelievably filthy. And we recognize that those different tolerance levels play into what makes sense for who's gonna do what. There's no way I could possibly clean well enough for that other person. So they might as well do it. And I'll do something they don't like to do. So there's a lot of you know, flexible fitting back and forth. And as long as everybody's chipping in, we don't try and measure it down to the last minute or anything like that. As long as everything gets done and no one feels overburdened, that's fine. And usually people wind up doing the things that they notice that bother them the most. Yeah. Nice. It's nice when, yeah, the, the flexibility works out in such a way that people want to contribute and you don't have to nag or yeah, try to try to get someone to do something. So good. All right. And, um, I do see, we have another uh, mention in the chat, uh, about, um, if any of you would like to talk with someone about starting a community and the idea of how, getting ideas for how different ones are structured. Um, so I'll let you respond in the chat. I will offer that FIC has a bunch of resources around this topic. Um, there's an excellent book um, that we carry in our bookstore written by Diana Leaf Christian called Creating a Life Together. And that's an excellent resource if you're thinking of starting a community. I'll put the link to our bookstore in the chat. And we also have an online course with Yana Ludwig. And Yana is the best person I could think of for being a resource for starting, um, starting intentional communities and is very knowledgeable about the movement as a whole and different models that exist. So I'll put those resources there. And yeah, and thank you again, all of you for, for participating in your time, like I was saying earlier. And uh, thank you also to our attendees who asked those wonderful questions. Um, I'm going to share with you our, uh, our evaluation form. If you'd like to share what you thought about this event, if you have ideas for future events, and uh, we also have the form there if you know of another community that you'd really like to take a tour of and have participate in this event. Um, I have the sign up form in the chat as well. Uh, so always looking for more communities to bring on for our virtual tour event, which we do every month on the fourth Thursday at this time. So hope to see some of you uh, join us again. And yeah, with that, I think we'll wrap up. And um, once again, much appreciation. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Appreciated all the information and questions. Yes, thank you, everyone. Cynthia, thank you for a fabulous job. You just really tied everything together so smoothly. So good, I'm glad. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Thank you all. Take care. Bye for us, Michael, Seth.